we are in an eight-week study that we're titling the letters to the seven churches of Revelation we are currently with the day looking at session number five we'll look at session number six next week and then we're off for a couple of three weeks due to the Christmas season and then we'll come back and do session seven and eight in January so what we have been doing is looking at the letters to the seven churches that are found in Revelation chapters two, chapters 1, 2, and 3. And we're looking at them trying to understand where the church was at that time frame, what was happening in the church in each city. And also looking at what that has to say for us in the present day. We are using as our primary source a commentary from John MacArthur called The Revelation, The Christian's Ultimate Victory. And we're also using the 2019 January Bible study, which is specifically on the letters to the seven churches. In session one, we looked at Revelation chapter one and tried to get a background of the book itself. Uh, we talked about the book being written by the Apostle John, who is the brother of the Apostle James, and was the author of the Gospel according to John. It's believed to have been written in about 95 AD, while John was exiled to the Isle of Patmos, which was a Roman penal colony off the coast of Asia Minor, which is today modern-day uh, Western Turkey. The letter was probably written as a circular letter, when I say letter, I'm referring to the entire book of Revelation. It was probably written as a circular letter intending to circulate among the seven churches that we're looking at. In session two, we began to look at each of the individual churches. The first letter that we looked at was the letter to the church at Ephesus. And each of these cities were places where John probably had ministered at some time during his life before being exiled. Uh, the city of Ephesus was the largest city in the Roman province of Asia. It was a commercial and political hub. It had many, many temples to heathen or pagan deities. And most of the daily life was connected to one of the pagan deities, either a Roman god or the Greek god. And in many cases, it was the same God. They just used a different name. It was an area where all of the trade guilds were connected to one of these gods. And in order to basically survive in daily life, you basically had to deal with the worship of these gods. The church there at Ephesus was probably one of the most important churches and probably one of the biggest, if not the biggest, church in Asia Minor. It was a church that was very busy, had lots of ministry going on, did lots of good things. But if you'll remember when we finished up with the church at Ephesus, Jesus had one criticism for it. And that criticism was that they had lost their first love and passion for him. The church at Ephesus was doing all the right things, but by the wrong motivation. In our third session, we looked at the church at Smyrna. The church at Smyrna was very similar to the church at Ephesus. It was a church located in a very populous, commercial, powerful city with lots of beautiful buildings. But again, trade unions, trade guilds as they called them then, were all connected to different of the gods. And because of that, it was very difficult for people to make a living without getting involved in the worship of other gods. It was also a city that had a very large Jewish population, which again made things very hard for the Christians who saw Christians as a heretic to the Judaistic religion. The letter to the church at Smyrna was the shortest of each of the seven letters, and it was one of only two churches that Christ did not have any criticism for. All he did was compliment them on how they were standing strong. The last time we met, we looked at session four, which was the church at Pergamon. And the church at Pergamon, again, the city was a very 
populous, commercial, um, powerful city that was again connected all with the gills as far as the worship of other gods. But in addition to that, Pergamon was known for its loyalty and its worship for the Roman Caesar, the Roman emperor. It was, in fact, the city who built the first temple to the Roman emperor. It was not a place that was friendly to Christians. And tonight we're going to move on to the fifth of the fourth of the seven cities, and this one is the city of Thyatira. So we'll get to that in just a minute, but as always, I always have a few opening things to, to say, just kind of get you in the mood for thinking about it. How many of you have ever heard the saying, one, and one bad apple spoils the bunch? Mm -hmm. yep. Growing up, I heard that a lot from my mother because she did a lot of shopping for fresh produce. And she would always look at a bag and she'd try to feel and look at everything in there to find out if there was a soft spot or anything wrong with it. Because if there was a soft spot or a bruise or something, that meant that that was going to infect the rest of the bag and the produce was going to spoil quicker. Vivian does the same thing. I would expect you guys all do the same thing too if you go shopping. I also remember, used in a different form, my mother talking about who are you hanging out with? Yes, there you who go. is your bad, who is the bad yeah. apple who's giving you bad habits? Because again, one bad apple, one bad friend can lead the entire group into actions that are probably not the best. Well, in the church at Thyatira, we had one bad apple. And that one bad apple was infecting the entire church and causing problems. And that's what we're going to look at tonight. So, take out your maps. Last time, I think I had you all draw connecting lines to where the churches were. So, if I didn't, I'm going to start. And if you haven't drawn lines, please draw lines. You should draw a line from Patmos to the city of Ephesus, which is where the book of Revelation and the first letter would have gone. So a line from Patmos to Ephesus, then from Ephesus to Smyrna, from Smyrna to Pergamon, and then from Pergamon to Thyatira. I mean, as we go along, we'll connect Sardis and Philadelphia and Laodicea, and then it comes back to Ephesus. So basically, there was a post road. There was a well-traveled road that went among all these cities for commerce. And that is how the letter, the book of Revelation, would have been circulated and how it would have gone to each of the individual cities and their churches. So we've looked at Ephesus, we've looked at Smyrna, we looked at Pergamum. Today we're going to look at Thyatira. Now, we don't know lots about Thyatira when it comes to historical. There's not a lot that we can say about it. There's a little bit that can be said about it. We know that the city was situated about 50 miles from the sea and that it had once been a great military city. In fact, it had been built Notice the location where Thyatira is in Pergamon. It had been built as a defense against invaders going to Pergamon. It had been built as, a, if you will, an early warning site to tell the citizens of, of Pergamon if an enemy force was approaching. And because of that, it had been attacked, destroyed, rebuilt, attacked, restored, rebuilt, several times in history. It had done its job. It had warned the citizens of Pergamon to be ready for an invasion, and it had basically been destroyed because it did its job. What we do know about Thyatira from Scripture, if you remember the name Lydia from the book of Acts, Lydia was a seller of purple, and at the time that Paul met her, when he first came to Greece or Macedonia as it was called then 
She was in the city of Philippi. But the scripture in Acts 16, 14 identifies her as a citizen of the city of Thyatira. And it's important to note that one of the things that Thyatira was known for was their purple cloth, was their uh, purple uh, garments and cloth, which was pretty much reserved for the upper class or royalty. Again, like all the other cities that we've looked at, the trade guilds in Thyatira were all connected to gods. They were all connected to pagan or heathen gods. So again, if you wanted to make a living, if you wanted to survive in the culture, you had to deal with these guilds who were, again, connected to heathen gods, which meant how did you avoid worship of some type with these gods. The church in Thyatira, though, succeeded in doing that. As we read the scripture tonight, we're going to find that Thyatira, in fact, was a vibrant, effective church for its day. However, it was tolerant of one heresy. And if you remember last time we met, the church there in Pergama also had an issue with tolerating a heresy, something that was not doctrinally pure. When we look at that, and as we go through the rest of these cities, it's going to be very important to notice that God frequently calls for purity of doctrine when it comes to uh, his churches. And if you don't have purity of doctrine, then it causes a problem, which is what we found in the church of Thyatira. It's also what we found in the church of Pergama. We're going to find it in other churches. It's a recurring theme across here. So let's start. We're in sec, uh, excuse me, Revelation chapter 2. We're going to start with verse 18, and we're going to go through verse, I believe, excuse me, I believe it's 29. So Revelations 2, verses 18 to 29. So, Francis, would you read 18, please? And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things which saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. Okay. And the whole one it says, To the angel of the church in Thyatira write. I just remind you that generally we look at the angel of the church as the pastor of the church. The pastor of the church would receive the letter. He was then responsible for reading it to the congregation. And each of the letters addressed a different issue, but every church heard every letter. So they heard every issue that every church had. And they also listened to the visions that the Apostle John wrote down after the letters that described the end times. Notice after the angel of the church at Thyatira write, we have a descriptor of who is writing. And each descriptor, each title to each church is different when we read. You look at how the church at Ephesus is addressed. You look at how the church at Smyrna, Pergama is addressed. You get to Thyatira. It's also addressed in a different form. So notice here that it says, the Son of God. This is the only place in Revelation that that term is used. The title, the Son of God, meaning Jesus is the one who's writing to you. It's the only place in Revelation that this specific term is used. And then he goes on to describe the Son of God. The one whose eyes are like a flaming or excuse me, a fiery flame, and whose feet are like fine bronze, says. Well, if you look back at Revelations 1.14, when John initially starts his vision, he has a vision of what Jesus looks like. And one of the things that's mentioned in Revelation 1.14 is his fiery eyes, is his eyes. And this imagery here, the symbolism here, is that 
the eyes literally see everything. And if you think of each of the letters that we've looked at so far, and the ones that are to come, Jesus says to all of the churches, I know where you live. I know what's going on in your lives. So here, he first defines himself as the Son of God, as divinity. And then he says, and oh, by the way, I see, I know everything. And then the feet of bronze. Again, you look at Revelations uh, 1, and we talk about feet of bronze, and the idea here is this was a very strong metal. It was used for weapons, so it's a symbol of judgment. So Jesus is basically saying to the church at Thyatira, I see all, I know all, and I judge all. Verse 19. John, would you read 19, please? I know you... <coughs> I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. Okay. Again, I said a minute ago, the fiery eyes represent I see everything, I know everything. Jesus says this to all the churches. Here he says, I know your works and he names all four of them. The first one is I know your love. The word for love here in the Greek is the word agape, which if you remember means sacrificial love, love that's more than an emotion, love that is actually self-serving, or others serving, not self-serving, but others serving. So you have a love that is not emotion. You have a love that is meant to meet the needs of others. Your faithfulness. Again, the Greek word here translates to what we would call reliability. I can rely on you to maintain love and the doctrine that you have been given. Your service. Again, the Greek word for service is the same word that is translated deacon today. So it's again talking about service to others. And then lastly, your endurance. Even though they were in a city where they were persecuted, where it was hard to make a living because they were not uh, connect to the trade guilds, they persevered in their love for God. And then notice at the end, it says, your last works are greater than your first. What did Jesus say about the church in Ephesus? You have left your first love. first love. Here he's saying to the church in Thyatira, you didn't leave your first love. You've actually increased your love. Your last works are greater than your first. Your love has actually grown as your service has grown, as your endurance has grown. So unlike the church at, Thyatira, at uh, Ephesus, Church of Thyatira, both were effective ministries. Both were out doing things in the community. But where the church in Ephesus was criticized because they were doing it under the wrong motivation, they had lost their first love of Christ, the church in Thyatira says, you haven't lost it. You have actually improved, increased your love from the first. <laughs> love to a stop there. But he doesn't. Verse 20. Dean? Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that the woman, you tolerate that woman Je Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. Okay. It would have been great if Jesus stopped with a commendation. But he has a criticism for the church here. But, even after all the good stuff I've said for it to you, but, or nevertheless, 
There's always a but. There's always a but. But I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel. Well, I think everybody here knows who Jezebel was. That was the wife of King Ahab who gave the prophets of old all kinds of fits. We don't know who Jezebel was. Biblical scholars disagree. Some scholars tell you that it really wasn't a person. It was, in fact, just a general heresy. So think back to the Church of Pergamon last time. The Church of Pergamon was criticized for their tolerance of some teachings that would have been uh, sexual immoral and the eating of food address or sacrifice to idols. Very same um, criticism that we see here in Thyatira. So was it the same general heresy or as some biblical scholars will tell you, it was in fact a real person. In fact, some biblical scholars supposed that it was actually the wife of the pastor of the church there who would have had considerable authority in the church. Basic answer is we don't know. There was either a person of some influence and charisma who is identified as a prophetess, which means she claimed to have revelations from God that she was giving to the church members, or it was a general heresy. We don't know which it was. But whichever it was, she was leading, or the heresy was leading the church members to commit sexual immorality and to eat meat sacrificed to idols. Same criticism that was given to the church in Pergamon. And remember, eating meat addressed or sacrificed to idols was basically meaning you're condoning the worship of that idol. So basically the criticism here was similar to the one in Pergamon. The criticism here is you're, um, you're tolerating these practices that are not part of your faith in order to get along in the community where you live. Now, again, from our standpoint, we can shake a finger at them. But remember, all the gills, all the things necessary for your daily life was connected in some manner to the worship of these gods. So it would have been very easy to tolerate practices that allowed you to survive and not to have to suffer as much. Again, we don't know who Jezebel was, whether it was a person or a general idea, but whatever it was, the church was tolerating impure doctrine. Basically, it's a criticism. 21 to 25. Bev, would you read those? Sure. Take your pick of which one you want to read from. I don't care. New International. New International. I mean, okay. I, 21 to 25. I can go with all the weird ones if you want me to. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Oh, wow. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teachings and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you. Only hold on to what you have until I come. Okay. Verse 21 says, I gave her time to repent, but she does not want to repent of her sexual immorality. The imagery here, or the way most biblical scholars interpret this, if there were members of the church who were not part of this heresy, who were not part of these practices that were part of the worship of the go other gods. So, in accordance with practice, they had gone to Jezebel, if it was a person, so we're going to consider it a person. They, they were gone to whoever was teaching these things and said, 
this is wrong, you need to repent. And in the Greek, it means they did it lots of times. It wasn't a matter of they went once. They went twice, three times, four times, maybe more times. Now what verse is it? Uh, We're on 21. Or about that. Yeah. So they went to her numerous times telling her to repent, and she refused to do so. She did not want to change her way of living. Verse 22 says, Look, I will throw her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of her practices. So God lays out three results or three punishments for this heresy. First, he says, I will throw her, meaning Jezebel, into a sickbed. Well, again, this could be read a couple of ways. It can be read literally a sickbed, which would mean that she was bedridden and unable to influence others in the church. It can also be read, and some biblical scholars read it this way, as saying that this is an image or a symbolism saying that at death she was going to Hades. She's going to what? Hell. So, but because she refused to repent, she could either be put on a literal sick bed so that she did not influence the rest of the church, or it could be referring to judgment at the end of time when she would literally face ultimate death. Now, are we calling hell Phoenix now? No, there is no Phoenix. Then the second okay. punishment says those who commit adultery with her were those church members who were following her practices. And notice that they are t said that they will be faced with great tribulation. So if you are a church member who's following these heretical teachings, then you're going to basically face the same punishment as Jezebel. Then in 23, we have the third punishment. 23 says, I will kill her children with the plague. Then all the churches will know that I am the one who examines minds and hearts, and I will give each of you according to your works. Now, children here, it should not be read as literal biological offspring. What he's actually saying here is, go back to punishment number two. Those followers of you, those who are your spiritual children, you will face the same fate as Jezebel if you don't repent. He's not saying that her biological children are going to die from the plague. The way the commentaries address it, these are her spiritual children, her followers who will face the same uh, punishment that she faces. Again, remember this goes to all of the churches. So think of being back to Pergama, which faces the same issue of tolerance for impure theology, the church there would have heard the same thing. But notice, verse 24, I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, so everybody else who's not following Jezebel's teachings, who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they say, I will not put any other burden on you. So the rest of the church who was not following these teachings, who did not listen to the prophetess who said, I have all these deep mysteries that only the elite know about. So if you're not following this, then you don't have to worry. I'm not going to put any other burden on you. But 25 says, but hold on to what you have until I come. Keep your purity of theology. Keep your pure beliefs. And this is one of several places that Jesus mentions in Revelation about his second coming. But notice here, and there's a couple of others in the later letters where he will mention it as well, he never talks about the timing of his return. It's usually about the condition of the church, which is what we're seeing here. So he's saying, 
Hold on to your purity so that when I come, I find you pure in your theology. 26 to 29. Uh, Janice, would you read those? Four. To him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my father, I will also give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay. So Jesus has said in 25, hold on to your pure doctrine until I come. And then in 26, he begins to address the reward. Remember in all the other letters, when you get to the end, there's a reward for those who have held on. So here he says, the victor and the one who keeps my works to the end. The one who is pure in their theology till the end. I will give him authority over the nations. Generally, this has been interpreted to mean during the millennial reign, the thousand year reign that talked about later in Revelation, believers will rule with Christ during that kingdom. In Revelations 1, he talks about being made a kingdom of priests and rulers and kings. When he talks about authority here and rule, the word that's used is usually the word that's used to describe how a pastor treats a church. So it's more of a rule of compassion rather than a rule of uh, discipline when we get there. So they're going to rule with him, but notice where the authority to rule comes from in verse 27. He will shepherd them with an iron scepter. He will shatter them like pottery, just as I received this from my father. The authority to rule comes from God the Father to God the Son, and because of a believer's relationship with God the Son, they have the authority to rule as well. And when it talks about um, shattering them like pottery, he's referring to those who have refused to accept the message of Christ. They have rejected salvation through faith in Christ. So therefore, they are, the words here, shattered like pottery, Think in the end when you face the judgment throne of God. This is where your works are uh, judged. And those who have not been written in the book of life end up being tossed into the lake of fire with the devil and all his angels. Believers never face that throne. Believers face the throne of Christ where our works are judged but not our salvation. Our salvation is assured but our works will be judged. And if you read later on in the, in the Revelations, they talk about being able to throw your crown and your rewards at the feet of Christ. That's what they're referring to. Works are judged. How you have fulfilled the mission that Christ has given you to go out into the world. But salvation is never in doubt. It's how well have you performed your mission that he has given you. And then notice verse 28. Here's the ultimate gift. I will also give him the morning star. If you're not familiar with that particular phraseology, check out Revelations 22:16. The morning star refers literally to Jesus himself. He is called the morning star. So the ultimate reward that a believer gets is the, um, the Savior himself. The relationship that you're going to have with him throughout creation or throughout eternity and then it ends anyone who has an ear should listen to what the spirit says to the churches again a encouragement to listen but remember the word listen in Greek has the implication of obedience to do something so the church the letter to the church at Thyatira ends somewhat differently than the churches that we have talked about so far. This is the first one where the church is promised authority in the millennial kingdom. 
Okay, let's look at the, the note sheets and we'll fill in any that you missed because I don't always say them exactly like they're written. Really? How about the first one? So the first one says, Thyatira lay about 50 miles from the sea and was once a great military city. It was located okay. 35 miles southeast of Pergamon. It was probably the least important of the seven cities. It was the least important of the seven cities. Remember, it was built as a warning station for the city of Pergamon. So it wasn't an important city by itself. It was important because of its location least in relation right to Pergamon. Yeah. So least important. Number two, Thyra Tower was well known for the development of trade guilds, to one of which Lydia Lydia may have belonged. You should have gotten that one. I got that one. Lydia. Well, I've got gods. Where did I get them? Okay, that's, the, that's, that's the next gods. one. Uh -huh. The, the social gods activities of the guilds me. were attached to the gods. worship of gods, or oh. heathen gods, pagan gods. They were worth tax to the worship of false gods. However you want to word it. Little G, guys. Little G, yes. And what says Lydia? Okay, so number three. The letter to the church in Thyatira is the longest of the seven letters and was perhaps the most difficult letter of the seven letters to write. I told you, I don't always say it the way I wrote it. <laughs> While the church had much to commend itself, it had one glaring fault. It had allowed one member to become a bad influence. It had allowed one member to become a bad influence on the congregation. It is why God calls frequently for purity and doctrine, purity and doctrine, and faithfulness in conduct. Purity in doctrine and faithfulness in conduct. Number four. In each letter, Jesus offers a different description of himself. In the letter to the church at Thyatira, he describes himself as the Son of God. Son of God, you got that one. This title only appears here in Revelation. It serves to assert Jesus's Divinity. Divinity, Divinity and authority. Divinity and authority. Number five, Jesus offers the church in Thyatira several compliments. He compliments their love, love, signifying a sacrificial serving love that moves past just emotion. Their faithfulness, faithfulness signifying their reliability in, the ser in their service to Christ. Their service and their endurance. No idea what the next one is. Okay, number six. After commending the church, Jesus lays two criticisms against them. Both criticisms involve a woman. Tolerant, <laughs> well, <laughs> a woman if you want. I'm not going there, John. <laughs> Both criticisms involve a tolerance for immorality. A tolerance for immorality. Yes, it's identified with a woman, John, but we don't know if it's a real person okay. or not. The Who church was then? compromising all of their maturity by tolerating and or following Jezebel. The church was tolerating the acceptance of worldly practices in order to fit in. Whoever Jezebel was, she had a great influence in the church. Number seven, having been given the opportunity to repent, she did not. God's punishment for Jezebel and those who followed her were was threefold. First, Jezebel would be thrown on a bed of suffering, or on a bed, bed of suffering, or into a sick bed. Something like that. Second, those who commit adultery with her were church members who had fallen into some moral compromise. They were following her teachings. This group needed to repent of their ways, for they would face suffering great tribulation. Or great tribulation. Okay. Third, I will kill her children. Her children were church members who wholly followed her teachings. This group faced the same, same fate. fate as Jezebel. Yes. Number eight, to the rest were church members who had not followed her teachings. This group was faithful. 
So no other bird. no other discipline or no further discipline was required for them. Number nine, those who overcome were share in Jesus' authority, authority over, over, the, over nations. the nations. Authority over the nations. They will rule with him. The authority to rule over the nations comes from God the Father. God the Father through Jesus or Jesus God, or the, God Son. the Son. Anybody miss one that I need to go back over? Glad that didn't hit your foot. I'd have to take it again. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What was the last authority one? Authority over the nations. Yes. The way biblical scholars interpret what he says is during the millennial kingdom when Jesus is the ruler of the world, believers will have a part in that rule. Are you okay? Never. Never. Hey, oh. you. Yeah, what? I see your sheet. Oh. <laughs> There's There's one. <laughs> okay, any questions, comments, anything you want to add? Okay. Okay, next week we go to the letter to mm -hmm. Sardis. Okay. Okay, let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to look at your word. We thank you that there are lessons to be learned. And as we've seen in some of the other letters, the lesson to be learned is to be discerning when it comes to theology, to test what is sold to us, what is preached from the pulpit by our own search of the scriptures to know what you have said and to make sure that it in fact tracks. Help us to be discerning. Help us to follow in pure doctrine throughout our lives. For we ask it in your name. Amen. Yeah.